Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for today's Peer-to-Peer -peer World Virtual Conference. This conference is brought to you by five companies that serve nonprofits. They've come together to share their unique experience and knowledge with you today. Richard, can you advance the slides? These companies are Accelerated Charity Growth, Budo, Cafexis Partners, Op3, and Turnkey. My name is New T, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief and Content Director at Nonprofit Pro. I'm delighted to join you today as MC for today's conference. The title of this session is called Find the Right Corporate Partner for Your Peer-to-Peer -peer Program and Get a Yes Quickly. During the session, please feel free to submit any questions you may have through the questions tab in your GoToWebinar control panel. The speakers will answer questions toward the end of the session. Also, please note that this session will be recorded and made available online after today's conference. But before I turn it over to our speakers, I wanted to tell you about a conference happening in Philadelphia on, in November called Peer to Peer Advanced. You can find more about that at p2p.nonprofitpro.com. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Rachel. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate everybody being here today. I know it's getting close to the end of the day for many. Um, so hopefully Rita and I can keep this uh, fun and exciting for everyone and um, make sure that it's super informative. So I wanted to give you all a little bit of background. These are literally a handful of the organizations that we, Rita and I, have worked with over the years. Um, and the reason that I wanted to share this with you in particular in regards to their sponsorship and corporate partnership programs and their peer-to-peer -peer, um, efforts is just that it runs the gamut from large organizations with lots of chapters and um, a large network to nationally based groups with, uh, you know, a large influencer at the helm to um, as you can see, Dell Children's Medical Center, and then also some smaller organizations that have, you know, a million or a $2 million annual operating budget, and they maybe have one event a year that's a local event. And so a lot of what you're going to be hearing today through the agenda um, is, you know, things that apply for all of those situations. So whether you're trying to um, work on sponsorships just for one peer-to-peer -peer event, or you're trying to work on something and you're thinking about how do I how do I start even from a national perspective, hopefully you'll be able to use some of this across the board. I will stop for a second and just introduce my amazing co-host here today, Rita Willoughby. <laughs> She's um, based here in Austin. Rita, I'll let you say hi. Hi, everybody. Glad to be here. Hope I can help. So Rita and I were just reminiscing. The first time we worked together was on an event back in 2009 for um, the Austin Film Society and Dell Children's, um, and it was a movie premiere. And just moving beyond that, we've now crossed paths a few different times, um, but have a pretty varied background as far as some of the campaigns that we've worked on and uh, and our approach to things. So you'll hear different opinions and some different ideas from both of us, and hopefully that'll allow you to pick the things that you think are gonna work best for you. So jumping right into our agenda, we're gonna focus on those five points that we promised we would cover for you today. How to create a prospect list from scratch, who to contact first, how to get them to listen to you, creating a pitch, and then finally asking for the sale and making sure that you um, are putting your best foot forward in that instance. As um, New mentioned earlier, if you have questions, feel free to add those into the chat area, and we will have a couple of opportunities for you guys to provide some feedback using three poll questions, and um, so hopefully you'll all participate in that because it gives us some good information. And as they mentioned, I'll also leave some Q&A at the very end so Rita and I can answer your questions if there's something you want us to provide more details about. So the first question um, that we wanted to um, talk to you about is kind of which of these is your biggest sponsorship challenge? Is it having dedicated staff and being pulled in a million directions? Is it resources and tools, not knowing even where to start? Is it just rejection? Nobody likes to be told no. 
um, or just I don't mind being told no, but um, I really feel like the um, my conversion rate's just not where it could be. Um, or just retention, getting people back um, can also be a challenge sometimes. And it looks like from the folks in the group right now that dedicated staffing um, and then not knowing where to start are kind of our two hot topics. So hopefully today, some of the things you're gonna learn will give you an opportunity to um, be able to focus and streamline and be a little bit more efficient with the way that you're approaching sponsorship sales and then knowing where to start we're going to start with some basics um, but then also some expert tips along the way um, so you can feel like a pro at the end of this so the the first thing we're going to cover is creating your prospect list um, a lot of times especially with new organizations or new event concepts you you know kind of sit down and say well who are we going to call where do we even start um, and even when you have an existing event, a lot of times there will be this prospect list that gets handed to you that was made up of a few board members writing a company name on a post-it or somebody texting you, why doesn't Walmart sponsor your event? Um, and just throwing out ideas, but not really being what we would call, what Rita and I would call a viable sponsorship prospect list. So there's a couple of things that I would suggest um, and this is where Rita's gonna chime in as well on things that have worked for her. But when you start thinking about your prospect list, the very first place we start obviously is if it's an opportunity to have a retention list, that would be number one. So if you have sponsors that have been a part of other programming, sponsors that have participated um, in other events that you have going on, or even for this, for your event itself. And one thing that I've found is sometimes, especially if you're new in the role or um, if you're just trying to come at this with a fresh perspective, I will absolutely add in sponsors from three, four years ago. And I've even gone as so far because some places don't have, you know, really great record keeping, pulling up old artwork and posters from events to look at the list of sponsors at the bottom of that and make a list myself and then reach back out to some of those groups to say you all partnered with us before can you tell me what happened what changed are you still interested would you be willing to talk um, and so definitely look at the idea of just who's been a part of your organization in the past and making sure you can have those folks on lockdown. The next one is obviously in regards to database research. Um, if you're lucky enough for your organization to have a really well implemented database, um, that is great. Um, and it's definitely a quick way to go, especially if you, you're looking in a specific region or area. So if you're trying to sell something, say in Austin or in Minneapolis, and then you have the ability to filter and look at different companies. But you can also get really creative with your database research, just like you do for potentially team recruitment for peer to peer. You can also start looking at those email addresses. So if you see a million addresses come up that have Dell in it, then definitely put Dell on your prospect list because you've got a lot of those folks already in your database. They're giving, they're volunteering, they're involved somehow. So you can take that to the sponsorship person at Dell and say, you know, we've been looking at our database and it looks like we have 200 of your employees already engaging with us in some way. We'd love to see how you all as a company could get involved. So taking a look at your database um, in a few different ways and not just um not just looking at it just from the pure standpoint of um company listings the next thing that i wanted to mention was um, social media and looking at uh, linkedin looking at instagram facebook all of those spots to type in different keywords hashtags um, and see what companies come up so if you're selling um, a walk event, say, for people with a bleeding disorder. Um, I did some work with the National Hemophilia Foundation, so that's on my mind right now. If you're, you're looking for sponsors in your area, though, for folks that might be interested in that, you know, get on social media and start looking at what companies are advertising, what companies are buying those Google keywords and popping up when you're there, and make a note of those things. And then as far as social media, also looking at opportunities with LinkedIn and 
this is where the dreaded conversation with your board members, where you sit in a board meeting and you say, um, hey, can everybody recommend two or three companies? And everybody stares at you quietly um, and there's just an awkward <laughs> silence. Uh, <laughs> the best way to go about that is to take a look at their LinkedIn before you even get to that meeting and say, Chris, I know for a fact that you're you are connected to these three companies. Can you introduce me to them? Um, and so it kind of takes the um, that awkward silence moment out and it really puts the pressure a little bit more on some of your leadership and some of your network uh, to be able to step up, but it does it in a really clear and concise way where they don't feel like, you know, they have to do a lot of thinking and you can help them help guide them. I'm gonna let Rita talk a little bit about other events because I know she's done a really good job, whether it's a new five um, of looking at what else is happening in the city. So Rita, do you wanna add anything about other events and where you go for that? Yes, absolutely. Well, um, thank you everybody. One of the things I wanna say first, um, I think since the majority of people were saying that staffing and is, is an issue, um, I have been a, a one-man person development department, and so I understand that. And so a lot of the information I'm going to give you is kind of from that perspective. And so um, you have to really, you know, because time is, is limited and, and your resources are limited, you have to kind of do uh, what's going to maximize your, your time and your effort. Um, and I will say real quickly on the database research or really any of this, if you can get an intern for free somewhere, you know, colleges, college departments have uh, lots of different, you know, like their communications department, all these different um, schools have uh, great opportunities to grab interns. And interns love doing this kind of stuff. And there's, you know, I've used interns um, a lot just because, um, it's another set of, of eyes and ears and arms and legs and everything. And so they've done a lot of work for me, um, especially in their research. And so with other events, one of the things that I have done, and, and Rachel touched on this, uh, with looking at old event flyers and things like that. But, for example, if I'm going to be doing a golf tournament, um, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, go online. I'm going to look for, I'm going to Google golf tournaments, and I'm going to find other companies uh, that sponsor other golf tournaments and then you know you can just kind of add those into your into your prospect list and then you can you know so looking at other other events in your area looking at um, if you're on a, you know if it's a national situation doing the same looking at um, golf tournaments in other areas you know and then you can even go you know define it even more where you could um, be specific about the um, the reason or the nonprofit that is being supported by that golf tournament or putting that golf tournament on. So you can find, you know, if one is um, for for cancer and and you happen to be raising money for a specific cancer, you can find other golf tournaments that have some affinity to what you're doing, um, and and then look at all the sponsors. And then, you know, add that into your pool, um, into your prospect list, and, and then you're going to have to kind of whittle it down and kind of, um, especially on a local level, if, if you have board members, you know, you can go to them if you have, you know, go to your sphere of influence and find out if there's any kind of connection. But um, I have gotten lots of, lots of sponsors just because I did some research and took some time to look at other events and see if I can find companies that, you know, had, you know, there's an interest there in, in what I'm trying to raise money for and my mission. And so uh, other events is a great way to look. And I've, I've found uh, information, you know, on social media. I found it online. I've gone to um, other organizations that are, have a similar mission. I've gone to their, their websites and looked at who, who are their sponsors. Um, and, you know, and, and this can take a lot of time. And so if you, ha if you can find an intern or get somebody part-time that can help you do a lot of that, you can really dive deep and get a lot of, um, a lot of potential uh, corporate sponsors that way. Great. I think one of the other things that 
um, has kind of advanced over the years are affinity reports. And this, you know, back in the day, 20 years ago, when, when I was selling sponsorships, I would um, usually do some kind of post events attendee survey. I would talk to our volunteers, steering committee members. I would, like I said, talk to all of our attendees. And one of the questions that I love to include on our surveys was just, what five brands do you most associate with or you do, do you most closely associate with? And then you would get some responses from them, whether it was a car company, it was their dry cleaner, it was what bank they use. And then you'd start to notice some trends. The large percentage of your attendees seem to all frequent Target versus Walmart, or they're using um, one brand of water versus another. And so having that information was always really helpful in one, building the prospect list, but then again, having that pitch to sell to the sponsor to say, we, you know, we surveyed our attendees and they love you, or we surveyed our attendees and you were there, but not as present as you could be we'd love to get your brand up there more um, with you know with more of our attendees it seems like this is the right audience what's really been great about technology is now using um, some mobile device ids um, and that kind of thing there's actually a way uh, for us to now look at you give us the location of your your events. So say if you have a walk and it's down at Zilker Park and you can give us the date and time, um, this is going to sound super creepy, but there's obviously a way that we can then <laughs> look at those phones and those devices that are there without looking at the individual's information. We can still get a really good reading on what companies are they following, where are they doing most of their online shopping, what brands are they associated with, and create an affinity report um, specifically from those devices. So this is really helpful when you're looking at things where, especially if you have a team and say not everybody is registering and so you don't have all their data or maybe your attendee surveys aren't getting filled out as much as you'd love, um, there's a way to kind of back into that information now. And then the last one that I wanted to talk briefly about is the sphere of influence exercise. This is one um, in regards to building your prospect list that I've done with quite a few clients and um, organizations where I've been working. Um, and so it's a pretty small, pretty quick process. I'm gonna kind of walk you through it and then I'll show you a quick sample and then we'll move on to uh, the next section. But doing the sphere of influence exercise really just is a large, it's a way to have a very targeted brainstorming um, to encourage and kind of trigger people's thoughts. So whether you do it by yourself or you do it with your staff or the board members or even the event committee, it's something you can do fairly quickly but get a lot of good info out. So what you're going to do is basically look at various networks and areas of influence. You're going to put some major buckets like business, corporate, faith, arts, government. Think about different neighborhoods that are um, in and around your area, schools that you might wanna tap into, and then be begin the brainstorming. And then as you're even looking at it, have your computer up, have your phones out, and be looking at things. Go through your Facebook friends, go through your LinkedIn contacts and filter by location or by industry, if that's something that you're looking at on more of a national scale and start to fill in the graphic. So this is what that ends up, this is the beginning of what that can look like. Um, so you can see this is for Marathon Kids, so they're celebrating their 25th anniversary next year, so 25 years running, and they're starting to build out the capital campaign and um, sponsorship program for the 25th anniversary. So they came up with different sections that we want to make sure we're targeting corporate media healthcare ad agencies faith running and so we went through um we went through each of these with them and then you can start to see the beginning of like in neighborhoods these are all the different areas that we want to touch with the campaign and the next step with that is okay who knows somebody in barton hills who knows someone in wesley and then you start to put in names and you're able to connect. Okay, Chris knows Susan and Westlake, and that's a way for us to follow up. 
So if you do that even in corporate, you could even break it down depending again on what your event concept is. You can break that down by industries or by locations, east, west coast, west coast. Um, you can do it by technology companies, um, consumer packaged good companies that might be located um, or interested and that you have a contact with. So as people start to think through these, it gives you just really quickly um, a great list to start with. And so I think this is one exercise that I've used for everything from a major donor campaign, um, like I said, to capital campaigns, sponsorships, even when we're trying to think about event committees and building those out. So once you get used to doing this exercise, you can absolutely, um, absolutely see, um, you know, how this can get built out and then create your, your database and your spreadsheet from here. Our next poll question is just to give Rita and I a little bit more insight into our amazing audience today, um, is how many years of sponsorship experience do you have? Um, I think that'll also help us tailor some of the additional content for the rest of the program to make sure that it um, fits with, um, you know, fits with where you guys are at. So if you'll take a second and add that in, it looks like we've got some really experienced folks. We've got about half so far, or really a third. We've got a third, a third, a third. Um, so that's exciting. So we've got a little bit of everybody. So we'll try to make sure that we're covering it all. Um, for everyone as we go. The next section is who to contact first. So this is all about once you've built your list, you've used all of those different building tools, the sphere of influence exercise, affinity reports, looked at other competing events or events similar to yours in other areas. Um, you've looked at your retention list. Now you've got this massive spreadsheet and it makes you wanna cry because you're trying to figure out how you're gonna actually reach all of those folks. Um, the one thing I wanna make sure I mention to everybody in the group is alphabetizing is a four letter word to me. So if I think what happens sometimes is you create the prospect list and then just by default, you alphabetize um, or organize it um, in that way and then you never know if maybe Zappos is your number one prospect but you're never going to get there because really the idea that we would make our way through the entire brainstormed pro prospect list um, is not reality so there's there's a way and a process in order for you to feel like you're not going crazy um, so have a game plan it's super important so number one um, definitely utilize technology. Make sure it's organized. Make sure it's compiled in one location. Um, I've worked with a lot of folks where I end up having to go find 15 different Google Sheets or Excel documents or somebody's emails that they've sent out in mass. Um, and it's all over the place. And so step one is really trying to consolidate everything. Um, and then the next piece is similar to what Rita was recommending on the interns. Evaluate too, before you really jump into some of this, the sponsorship asks that you have and if there's, are, are there other folks that can help you? So what I mean with that is sometimes I'll look at our sponsorship inventory for a program and say, I need to sell, you know, things from 250,000 to 500,000, but I also have a ton of stuff at this lower level, five to 25,000 to 100. Um, and so depending on the project, obviously. And so what I'll do is find whether it's someone else in, you know, if you have a large development department or if you have a sponsorship team on your steering committee for your event program, um, or again, interns or others to kind of help so I break that into different levels. So looking at your asks and then deciding, are some of these folks not gonna be high level asks, they're gonna be lower level asks, and are there others that I can engage to at least get the ball rolling so that they're doing some of the initial outreach and then I'm only getting pulled in when we need to make an ask. And then the next thing um, that I wanted to mention to everyone is really looking at creating your prospect filter. Um, so hopefully you guys are using a prospect filter tool, 
But basically what that looks like um, is the idea of what questions do you initially ask yourself, kind of your gut check. When someone says, oh, you should call um, Martinizing Dry Cleaning for a sponsorship, um, usually as a development professional, you can pretty quickly go through a list of about 20 questions in your head and say that is or is not a good idea. And what the, the filter actually does for you is it documents that process. So um, as an example, like when we worked with influencers, you know, I worked with Toby Keith and um, Andy Roddick and talking to, to that, you know, team, the executive directors, the, the event committees there, looking at the idea if the sponsorship is going to require some of that influencer's time um, in order to close the deal, that would be kind of, they would go further down on the list. So we would score that, say, a two instead of a 10. Um, and then if we looked at mission match, location match, do we have a warm lead? So each of these things basically gives us an indication of whether or not they're a hot prospect or a cold prospect. Um, and so by documenting that prospect filter and then looking at your list and kind of scoring everybody and saying there, and you can get complicated, like I said, with numbers one to 10, you can keep it simple saying they're a tier one, tier two, or tier three, but it's just really important that you use some kind of device to, um, and filter to um, prioritize and separate out your best prospects. Because again, as you all mentioned earlier, you don't have a lot of time. So we need to make sure we're spending the little bit of time that we do have on the right people. Um, and then using that filter uh, to determine the warm leads. And I'm gonna stop for a second and just ask mm -hmm. Rita, you know, when you're looking at uh, prioritizing your contact list and you, you know, you get handed a list, say by a client or you're new at an organization and you've built a list, what are some other things that maybe you've done to, um, to also uh, have a game plan and make sure that there's some rhyme or reason to that list? I think one of the things, there's a couple of things. So uh, one of the ways that I, I organize, and I'm a, I'm a big spreadsheet person. I, I love Excel. And so, um, and I'm, I'm very visual. So I love putting things into a spreadsheet, but I, I will tend to organize them in, in, one or one of two ways. Um, one is kind of by warmest lead. Um, if they've been a previous sponsor, if there's, you know, we have a really close connection to the person, the decision maker at a company, um, those will be kind of at the top of my list. And then as my list, as I go down the list, they'll be, you know, less warm and, you know, to the ones that are really not quite um, a lead but, you know, maybe, you know, have some potential. The other way I like to do it is affinity to what we're doing. So, for example, if I'm doing um, a run or a walk event, then, you know, I'm looking at the list and those companies that have, you know, you're looking at, and, and you can kind of do this with the, um, the sample sphere of influence that Rachel was using earlier, um, you can do that for sponsorships. So, you know, if you have a run, for example, then, you know, what, what company, what type of companies would be potentially interested in, in a running event? You know, you have um, hospitals and um, emergency care, and then you have, you know, uh, chiropractors, and you have um, on and on and on. So you can kind of put together your list based on those kinds of companies that would have a strong affiliation or affinity with the kind of event you're doing. And then obviously within that list, you know, then you want to prioritize them by, you know, how do you have a good contact there? Or have they, you know, uh, been a sponsor before and how warm the lead is within those confines. So, um, because I think once you, if you do this, um, the, of influence diagram and you kind of go through that process for sponsorship, you will find that there are so many different types of potential sponsors for an event that you never really thought of that, um, that as you go through this process are helping you kind of brainstorm on potential sponsors. And so I think, um, and you want to, 
you want to make it as easy as possible and as less um, complicated and, and you know, you don't want to be overwhelmed. So you want to take it, I think, you know, small chunks at a time. So warm leads, obviously, first. Um, you know, obviously, those that have been a sponsor uh, previous um, are, you know, high on the priority list. But um, so those are kind of the two ways that I do that. Does that make sense? Yep, that's perfect. That's great. Super helpful. I think the the thing I'll just throw out too, um, the filter might seem like a little bit of a silly exercise sometimes, but it it can be a game changer for your sponsorship program. Um, just for the reasons that you see here as far as involving people, giving them some insight, because once you educate them, once you share a little bit more about the process, they can be more helpful because then they're using the same filter. So instead of those random texts that you get about some company, like, why doesn't Apple just sponsor our <laughs> local fun run? I, I get that one a lot. Um, so you know, then all of a sudden they've been educated and they kind of start to see what they should be looking at and how they should filter their ideas as well, which helps them to be more productive and impactful, which makes them more excited. It also just allows you to stop wasting time on any dead end leads. And again, we don't have time to waste, so that's a good thing. Um, and so hopefully the idea of the filter is great. You can um, do it pretty quickly. It can take you just a few minutes or you could even do it at a staff meeting um, or a development team meeting as well. The next section we're gonna talk about is what's the hook? Yeah, now that you've got your prospect list and you've prioritized it so you know who your best leads are, the best chance of you getting a yes um, and not having to um, get all of the, the no's, is what's the hook? What are we gonna say? Um, how are we gonna get people's attention? Um, so, you know, it's hard. Um, you know, when you think about everyone you approach and you get an, a meeting with, they're absolutely saying, I've got a stack of these proposals or I've been invited to 15 different events that weekend or we've got, you know, three other national peer-to-peer -peer programs that we're considering right now. And so what are we gonna do in order to get their attention now that we know who they are that we want to talk to. So what I'll say about that is key messaging, prepare, prepare, prepare. Um, the first thing that I always do on my side is knowing my value proposition. Um, and this is, I think, really important from the nonprofit perspective, because sometimes we tend to lead with the mission of our organization, the impact of our organization. And while that makes sense um, in a lot of different ways when you're talking to general donors um, or capital campaign donors or um, even some of your team recruitment more so, but when you're talking to a corporate partner that is considering giving you their advertising dollars, um, their marketing spend, you need to really understand what is the value that your organization or this particular program is bringing to their company regardless which is hard to put that in a, you know aside for a second but regardless of the good that that impact or that um, sponsorship is going to do and how you're going to use the money at the end step one is really understanding for that organization um, how are you going to be a value? Because when you're looking at sponsorship dollars, you absolutely are competing with, um, you know, the local music festival that's happening with the local radio station. You're, look, you're competing with their Facebook boost spend um, and a few other things that are on their normal marketing budget. So really understanding where do you fit, not just where do we fit in the competition landscape among other nonprofits, among other peer-to-peer -peer programs, but really are we, do we have value, um, you know, in regards for this company? And I think this is where too, you can get really creative. A lot of times, um, you know, looking at your program, you'll see some of the obvious stuff like signage opportunities, sampling, um, PA announcements, that kind of thing. But really digging in a little deeper to say, where is their value that we haven't really been um, marketing it properly or promoting it? So 
you know, is there an opportunity for you to say, we're going to sell a sponsorship to be our volunteer sponsor and underwrite all of our volunteers. We're going to have an end of um, event volunteer thank you party, um, those kinds of things. So looking at your assets for the event and really doing an asset inventory to say, what do we truly have that could be of value to someone? And then separately from there, the other thing that I would say is also know that the days where you can go back and say, um, okay, there's a, a um, an event and we have a VIP hospitality area and there's 50 people that are going to be in there and that's only worth, you know, a thousand dollars. You really have to also understand the math behind what is the value to that specific company that you're pitching. So. As an example, if I'm pitching um, a VIP space and it or VIP section of the peer-to-peer the -peer event, and it's only 50 people, but those 50 people have the buying power of um, you know a million dollars across the group, then I'm looking at you know higher dollar car companies, I'm looking at the Rolexes of the world and those kinds of organizations, and for them they know their lifetime value of those potential customers they know how many of those folks are probably already customers versus what their acquisition is that they're interested in and so the value for somebody like that is going to be a lot different than just on the surface saying it's 50 people in a tent and we just need to get that underwritten so i'm selling it for a five thousand dollar sponsorship so really understanding the value um and you know I'll go as so far as to say for we were selling an event um, we went through the parking lot and I think I've mentioned this maybe last year or the year before but went through the parking lot and counted up how many Cadillacs um, versus Lexuses were in the parking lot and then took that information to the local dealers and said we want to help you get a larger percentage of our participants next year knowing that if we could grow that by five percent over the course of the next two to three years What's the value of that for that dealership based on their average car purchase and the profit margins? And so then we were able to back in from there what the true cost of that sponsorship program should be because it's basically about half. So if they know they're going to gain a hundred thousand um, dollars, then they may be willing to pay anywhere from twenty-five to fifty for that sponsorship opportunity because the ROI is there. So just think creatively about the value proposition. Um, the first meeting, and I know Rita can, can speak to this because she does an amazing job at this. The first meeting that you get with them when you're trying to hook them in and get them excited, this definitely follows the old adage of people, there's nothing people love talking more about than themselves. Um, and so if you will spend that first meeting, that call, um, really focusing not just on the sale itself and kind of here's what we have and will you say yes but more on the idea of finding a way to connect building rapport with them um, understanding why they may personally be connected to your cause um, or your program or what gets them excited about it um, and and what could be of interest is really important i'm going to stop there rita and just ask do you have anything any thoughts you want to add in regards to kind of at that first meeting, how do you start to hook them in and, and make sure that they take your next call and the next meeting and the one after that? Uh, well, I think, you know, um, we're in a people business and, um, and you take away all of the technology uh, and, you know, those are, those are wonderful, but it's still, a, it's still really a people to people business. And so you really have to focus on building relationships because nobody's going to do business with somebody that they don't have a connection with or don't feel comfortable with. And so it's really important to, uh, when you first meet somebody, to just kind of focus on building that relationship and getting to know them and what's important. And I'm, and I'm going to give you a quick example on, uh, on a sponsorship, you know, kind of thinking out of the box. And I did this uh, with the Dennis Quaid charity weekend event here that was in Austin several years ago. And at that time, I was the marketing director for a company, and they were coming at us to be a sponsor. And, you know, there's a lot of businesses out there that have a client base. And so we used that opportunity. We did become a sponsor. 
And with that sponsorship, we had tickets to several different events because it was a three-day weekend with lots of different events. We had VIP opportunities. And so I turned around and I sold that to the agents. Uh, it was a financial services company and turned around and sold those tickets uh, to our agents. And so th those agents used the ticket opportunity as a client appreciation opportunity. So, you know, there's anybody that has a client base um, is always looking, you know, not so much for themselves and how can they get their name out, but really what's a way that they can in turn um, kind of pass that through to their clients and, um, and kind of use that leverage to, uh, maximize the relationship with with their uh, with their client base so it's kind of a, a creative out of the box kind of thing to do and so think about all those different types of companies that have um, client base you know mortgage companies realtors um, financial services insurance companies all of those kind of, of um, companies and, and they usually have good marketing dollars but once again you know the relationship is really Key, and I think it's really important to spend those first couple of meetings on on what is important. You know, I think for me, for many years, I always looked at um, here's what we have to offer you, instead of kind of flipping it and looking at how can we maximize an opportunity for you to, uh, ex you know, for your company get your name uh, get some name recognition out in the community. Um, if you have, you know, what's, you know, you have to find out what's important to them. Employees, you know, do they want to engage their employees? Is there an opportunity uh, for their employees to get involved in the event? Um, obviously, the marketing and the branding. Um, but I think now, these days, employee engagement is becoming much more um, of a concern as they hire people, the people they hire. Um, Community service is very important to them, and so they're looking for opportunities to engage their employees. And so as you're putting your sponsorship opportunities together, kind of keep that in mind because that, um, that's becoming very, very relevant and very important to a lot of these companies. And then, you know, just think outside the box, you know, think creatively and try to come up with opportunities, but really be, instead of being focused on, you know, as the nonprofit and as the um, promoter of an event and the person selling sponsorship, you know, instead of focused on being focused on, you know, what do we have to, uh, what can you do for us? You know, you need to kind of flip it and, and really go uh, after the point of view of the person you're talking to and how can you help them um, expose their company and their branding and, you know, really do what's best for them. I think a couple of things too to to think about. One is helping them envision the possibilities. So, you know, when we when I've been working with a couple of organizations that really maybe even only have a small database, maybe the database only has 10,000 or even 50,000 names in it, say, um but but really, truly, the larger market opportunity is 20 million. Um, being able to go to that sponsor and talk to them about, we together could work to bring this group together, to identify these community members, to rally them for the cause. And so, yes, we may have a small database right now, but if we're successful as a team um, and as partners, look at what we can do together. And then also from that standpoint, realizing that when you are talking to these folks and your hook is the fact that you get the honor and privilege of representing these communities that they're looking to tap into for whatever reason. Um, so it's obviously somebody that is in their demographics, they're looking to sell products or services to and you're the gateway for that and so being able to promote that and the one thing that I'll say there too is one of the best hooks is looking at what can you tell them because you are so intimately involved with your organization with that community that that company would not find through Siri or Google or even on your own website so one thing that you know I've talked to a lot of sponsors in the past and one of their big issues is we sit down face to face with someone and they basically tell me everything that I could have read online. 
and that's not really helping my marketing insights that's not helping my advertising and so by taking a minute and really thinking about what kind of kind of insider information do i have about this community that i can offer like did you know that you know patients with als are you know are using this product at a growing rate or did you know that kids um, that are having wishes granted and the volunteers more importantly that are involved with them are all looking at um, additional ways to get involved or whatever it might be so looking at what do you know about your audience that is almost like a secret that you can carry with you from sponsorship meeting to meeting um, that really would start to give these folks some some insight and make you feel like um, they need to pick up the phone and talk to you if they really want to get in the know. And then also thinking about when you're talking to them, what's that one story or even vision moment you can share so that they can get excited about it? So we go in sometimes and kind of paint the picture and this is what's going to happen. But if you stop a second with them and just say, you know, I'm excited about this opportunity and for us to possibly work together because what if? And then you kind of talk blue sky, 50,000 foot level. What if in three years we're able to grow this thing to 10,000 people together, the impact that could have on your business and our organization? And what if we were able to rally additional corporate vendors of yours um, and how that would build a sense of community among your organization. So just talking through the what ifs and then even asking them, when you think about the possibility of sponsoring us, what are some of the things that get you excited about it? What are some of your what ifs? Um, and that gets people feeling a sense of ownership and excitement and then obviously making it memorable and shareable. You know, when we give a lot of stats and just general information, sometimes we tend to lose um, lose the ability for the person we're selling to to go back to their teams to their companies to say oh my gosh I just met with the most amazing person from Unite for Bleeding Disorders listen to this and being able to share that story um, sometimes our sponsorship decks get a little too mired down in the details and that you get three banners and you get X hospitality <laughs> um, and so just really making sure that you leave them with those stories um, and with those ideas that they want to take forward and share. So creating yeah, a dynamic it's all about making the impact. Yeah, exactly. It's all about making the impact and getting them excited. Again, not necessarily just when you think memorable and shareable though, don't just think about mem sometimes we tend to go mission story. Um, so memorable and shareable on the mission side of okay once they sponsor and the event successful then their dollars do this but what you really want to even be talking about is take a look at how this partner has partnered with us and now they've grown to 15 new retail outlets and their employees are super involved and it's one of their crowning jewels and people actually they've recruited some of their new staff members have been participants and volunteers because there's such a close connection and alignment of our two organizations. So as your company's looking to grow, there's a great HR opportunity and recruitment here. So just thinking through not just the general mission impact story, but thinking through what is the, the sponsorship impact story that you can tie into. So we've got just a few minutes left, so I'm going to go quickly through kind of creating the pitch and closing. Um, obviously, this, this deck is going to be available um, on the conference website, so please feel free to reference it. I've also got our contact info, so you can reach out to Rita and I if you have specific questions. When you're creating the pitch, the first thing that I wanted to talk to you all about is um, determine how you'll present the proposal. You have to get creative in some ways. So when we were pitching Nike originally for the wristband campaign, we didn't go back to them with you know, a PowerPoint deck and say, this is what we're doing. We actually spent the money and the time, um, and I think we had you know, about a week or so to pull it all together, um, but spent the time to do a video presentation because Nike is all about the visual, the music, the feeling. So think about who you're presenting to. Is your best way to present 
just doing it without a deck? Is it doing it with one and handouts versus on a screen? Is it a video? Is it um, in bringing in additional folks to help tell the story, bringing in a volunteer from the event, bringing in a participant or a, one of your other sponsors to help you make the sale? So think through first, don't, don't just automatically default to presentation. I think we all kind of tend to go that direction and sometimes there's a better way to make the ask. Um, also be thinking about when you're creating the pitch, who is that person gonna have to share this with? Because you wanna make sure that it's something that they can pass along, um, but also that it doesn't get lost in translation. So if you've done any research on like venture um, investment company, when you're a startup organizational seed funding pitch, your initial deck is literally limited to six slides. You might be asking for a million bucks, but it's in six slides and it's billboard style, no more than seven words on, on the page. Um, but then your follow-up deck that goes to them um, actually has more of the narrative built into each slide because you know that that's gonna get passed along without you being able to speak to it. So think too about what is it you might be presenting to, but then also what is your leave behind? Because they may be slightly different. Make sure you're highlighting your differentiation. You know, as Rita was talking, you think through, oh my gosh, every run company in town, right, gets hit up for every 5K that maybe is coming through the city. Um, but is there something that sets your organization apart as far as whether it's, you know, what is the information about the community that you're representing? Um, is it even the neighborhood that it's pulling from? Is it um, the their socioeconomic information? So just thinking about what is it that you can, you know, not just makes you distinct, but just different um, and, and sets you apart from the other 25 pitches that they're going to get. Um, so really be thinking about that and put your glasses on when you think about, okay, if I were to get five of these proposals today, why does this one stand out versus the others? Then one thing that um, Mandy O'Neill, I don't know if you guys have ever worked with her from Connected Nonprofit, she does a really great job of um, creating a draft and then reviewing that prior to formally submitting the proposal. So what that looks like is you get on a go-to meeting or Zoom, you've got a memo draft of the proposal, you get your contact at the company to actually look through it with you and you edit it together. And then you use that draft to actually create the, the deck um, if that's the direction you're going. What happens then is you actually have something that they're proud of because they helped make it. And so now when they take that internally, they're saying, we did this together. This is our proposal to you. And so that's a really great um, tool. Make sure that you make the ask in the pitch deck um, and, and through that process so that they know at the end of the day, what is that call to action? You want them to be a sponsor of your event. Um, and why. And then make sure again that you include next steps that are easy to complete. I always try to include the next steps timeline to say, here's your proposal. If you agree with this proposal, then these are the next three things that are going to happen. We're going to have a signed agreement. We're going to do a kickoff call. We're going to exchange graphics. We're going to assign key team members um, so that they also start getting into the mindset of um, really implementation. Um, and moving forward with the deal. And then we have one more poll question here, uh, which is just in regards to how much research you're doing before you call those prospects and leads. And this is just really important, again, um, in the idea of, you know, how much time and energy are you putting in to get to know these organizations before you show up on their doorstep? Um, and where are you looking? Are you looking at the, you know, 25 million websites um, and resources? Are you interviewing former staff members that you happen to be connected to? Uh, those kinds of things. Are you actually going to their stores and sitting in and looking at their customers and their employees and getting to know them? So really taking a look at um, your prospect research before you get in with that lead can go a long way in all of, um, all of this process. So then in regards to making the ask, I wanted to actually just keep it really simple. These are some closing lines that you might consider using. So um, if you look at, I'm not gonna read through all of these, but it seems 
of your company, what do you think? Is that a yes? Um, if we could throw in one additional hospitality tent, would that convince you to commit today to your sponsorship? Um, so um, the last one, you're interested in X and Y features. If we could get started today, we can guarantee that and we can get this sponsorship out into the world by next week. So making sure you know kind of you know what your clothesline is, um, and then also looking at what not to do. So a couple of things that I just want to make sure um, we cover: don't say, don't leave the pitch deck out there, kind of hanging, and then say, "I'll touch base in a few weeks." That you've lost the time and the momentum. So make sure that you're really setting the next meeting or call date. You're understanding when there's decision time, um, follow up. When you're making the ask, don't be afraid to look in the eye, and you know because you really need to have confidence in the in the ask that you're making and the value that you're offering to them. And if you don't have that, then go practice more with friends, family, find a few friendly prospects uh, that you can say, "Look, I'm not going to actually ask you for money, but I just want you to give me feedback on what I'm telling you." Um, and see how I'm presenting my nonverbal cues, my communication skills, what could I be doing differently? And then even if they say no, ask them then for volunteers, sign up for a team for our event. Um, or <clears throat> I've actually gotten, I've gotten good sponsorships from people that have turned me down because we've gone through the whole sales process and now they're like, you know, this actually isn't for our brand Whole Foods, but you should be talking to HEB. Um, so definitely take a look at, you know, depending on, you know, even when they say no, at this point, they've spent time with you. They're somewhat invested in what you're doing. So be sure that you take advantage of that um, and, and reach out um, to them and ask for those next steps. And then I just want to encourage you guys, don't be afraid to be amazing. Sponsorship, you know, one of my most favorite sponsorship moments ever. I had a deck in my purse. I was headed into a meeting. It was an ask for $5,000. And when I got into the meeting and I started doing all of that rapport building and finding out what they want and learning more about their business, all of a sudden I realized what we had was extremely valuable to them, more than $5,000. So I kept that deck in my purse and I asked them for $50,000 sponsorship <laughs> instead <laughs> and I got it. And so I just want to encourage you guys to absolutely don't be afraid to be amazing. Know what you have to sell. Be proud of what you've put together um, and go in knowing your value, um, both personally and professionally. You're going to be a resource for them as part of their marketing team, extended marketing team. So get excited about that. Here's some additional resources that um, a book. Amelia is a software program that helps you kind of map out your sales process um, as far as literally you're in the car, you're driving from you know store to store, if that's where you're at on your sponsorship sales. So some things to look at, some amazing events coming up, peer-to-peer -peer advance and peer-to-peer -peer forum. Um, there's a learning lab uh, is one of my programs that has a, a on-demand training program. And then also check out our website for some additional info. Um, I want to just thank Rita for joining me today. And this is all of our information. Hopefully you guys will connect with us on LinkedIn. And I'm going to stop for a second and just see if there were any questions. I know we only have one minute. So any questions at all um, that I might need to answer. And Rita, anything that you might have to add as a, a last parting words? Well, no, I'm happy to talk to anybody offline uh, or you know, later after this is over, I certainly um, have a perspective from a small nonprofit and um, a one-man shop, so certainly know how to help and um, answer questions that might pertain to some of you that, that are in those kind of situations. Great. Well, it doesn't look like we have any questions, so I'm going to hand it over to Nu and let her close us out. Awesome. Thank you so much, ladies. It was so clear and concise and detailed. And, you know, I personally learned a lot from this session, so I appreciate it. So unfortunately, we reached the end of our time for this session. This is the last session of the day. Thank you so much for joining us. And hopefully we'll see you next year for Peer to Peer World.
Thank you. Thank you.